you have experienced years of abuse, torrents or verbal castigation and chastising, harsh criticism, humiliation, public and private shaming, degradation. It seems as if the narcissist's only role and only job <laughs> was to take you down, to pull you apart, to negate you and to vitiate you until you are no more. And then one day you witness a miracle much bigger than the parting of the Red Sea. The narcissist is shedding tears. Yes, you heard me correctly. He is shedding tears, also known as crying. <laughs> the narcissist is crying and you love it. You want more of it. Why? For two reasons. Some of you believe that the narcissist's tears are proof positive that there is something inside him which is redeemable, that there is an inner child or a part of the narcissist which craves for love and compassion, and that given these, the narcissist can heal and become whole and re-enter your life as a benign presence. And so the narcissist's tears tend to substantiate this view of the narcissist as a flawed being, but not beyond help. Others, other victims of narcissistic abuse, simply cherish the moment. It's a form of retribution, giving the narcissist a taste of his own medicine. Witnessing the narcissist in his moment of collapse, frustration, anger, helplessness, and hopelessness is a salve. It's a form of medicating the torture that has been your pseudo-relationship with a narcissist. So, some victims of abuse are delusional, malignantly optimistic, with pathological hope, as Shadow the Angelist called it, calls it, and others are simply vengeful, and they cherish and relish the backlash and the payback that the narcissist ostensibly is experiencing. But both groups of victims of abuse are getting it wrong. The narcissist cries for no reason known to healthy, normal human beings. <laughs> Today we're going to explore the etiology of the narcissist's tears, the causation. What makes the narcissist cry indeed? Actually, this is the second video in which I've dealt with the narcissist's displays of sentimentality and crying. Watch the first one titled, Why Narcissists Cry at the Movies? Self-pity, not empathy. You need to know this before we proceed. Next time you see your narcissist lacrimose, next time his cheeks are swathed and washed by a torrent of tears, flee away, run away, escape, you're in danger. Crying is a warning signal. It's a red alert for reasons which I will expound upon a bit later. Crying is also a part of the prosody of entraining. In other words, it's part and parcel of the narcissist's brainwashing. It's a manipulative technique. It's not intended as a form of communication. Look, I'm crying, I'm hurting, I'm sad, I'm broken, help me. That's not how the narcissist experiences his tears. Tears, like everything else, like any other type of behavior, like any form of display, affect display, Tears are meant to induce in you behaviors, to modify your conduct. In other words, tears are Machiavellian, manipulative. And apropos tears, my name is Sam Baknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, the first book ever on narcissistic abuse, and a professor of clinical psychology 
in multiple universities too numerous to count, most recently Southeast European University. Okay, the narcissist is crying. Your instinct, your reflex is to hug him, to embrace him, to offer succor, succor and assistance and help and to commiserate or even provide advice. Perhaps your reflex is actually to, as I said, relish the moment, add to the narcissist's um, misery, somehow push him down even further, degrade and humiliate him, confront him with his own weakness and vulnerability. Both reflexes are dangerous, very dangerous, for reasons which I will explain in a minute. Number one, don't forget that you do not exist. As far as a narcissist is concerned, you do not exist as an external object. You are a wraith, an internal object, an apparition, an emanation, and most probably a miasma. In other words, you do not possess an existence that is independent of the narcissist's mind. When you defy this role, when you defy your status as an internal object, you frustrate the narcissist. When you engage in behaviors which are proof positive of independence, personal autonomy, agency, decision-making, when you have your own social circle, your own supportive family, your own friends, this, these are challenges. In the eyes of the narcissist, you're trying to undermine you're trying to sabotage the internal, cohesive and coherent structure of his world, of his mind, as he perceives it. It's actually not coherent and not cohesive, not orderly and not structured. But the narcissist, as usual, deceives himself into believing that it is. Any challenge from the outside threatens to unsettle the precarious balance of the narcissist's mind. And he's not going to forgive you for this. When you frustrate the narcissist, when you defy the narcissist's expectations, when you act in a way which is agentic and independent and autonomous, when you make decisions and choices which are not in accordance with the narcissist's shared fantasy and the narrative that he is trying to impose on you, in all these cases, you are not only frustrating the narcissist, but you are threatening him. The narcissist perceives this as a hostile act, and you become instantly a persecutory object, an enemy. There's a sense not only of frustration, but a sense of loss of control and enormous anxiety. This leads to emotional dysregulation of negative effects. In other words, this leads to rage, this leads to envy, this leads to um, a kind of attempt to destroy you somehow, to remove you, etc. You're challenging the narcissist's grandiosity, and you're placing him face to face with his shame and his vulnerability. And this generates in him self pity. Narcissists use crying as a form of virtue signaling and self victimization. When the narcissist cries, is sending out a signal. I'm a victim. I am moral. I'm righteous. I haven't done anything wrong. And look what he or she is doing to me. It's a manipulative tactic. But it's important to understand that the narcissist cries intentionally, deliberately. It's a deliberate act. Whereas in the vast majority of healthy and normal people, narcissist, uh, crying is a reflex. It's reflexive. It's uncontrollable and it's usually the outcome of empathy. When the word empathy was first coined by a German, no less, <laughs> the original word was Einfühlung. That means a unity of emotions. And it was applied at the very beginning, about a hundred and something years ago, the word empathy 
was applied, applied to works of art. People's reactions to paintings and to sculptures, this is what scholars of the time described as empathy. And indeed, when we are faced with a painting, with a movie, with a piece of art, with another person in distress, with sadness, with circumstances, certain circumstances like war or conflict or hunger, when we are exposed to images in the news, etc., etc., we don't sit down and say, okay, this is very sad, and the appropriate reaction, the appropriate effect, would be to cry. <laughs> People don't do that. <laughs> they cry because they cannot help it. This is not the case with the narcissist. The narcissist is crying like absolutely everything else in his repertory, like every single aspect and dimension of his endless choreography. The narcissist crying is instrumental. It is intended to convey a message, to signal, especially virtue signal, to establish a position of victimhood, to manipulate his environment, to influence your behaviors, to shame you, to guilt trip you, to emotionally blackmail you, and to trigger in you empathy and maternal instincts. This may not always work. <laughs> the narcissist may cry and find to his utter shock that his intimate partner or his best friend or his co-workers find, it, find his crying hilarious and very welcome. But even then, it induces in people a loss of control. The narcissist crying creates a loss of control. The narcissist tears dysregulate people, whether positively or negatively. They may enhance empathy and trigger maternal instincts, or they may cause people to behave in ways which are essentially socially unacceptable and even disgraceful. They may become vengeful. They may become rageful. Whatever the case may be, the narcissist crying, the narcissist lacrimose tears, they place people under the narcissist control and sway. Because the narcissist tears cause people a form of disorientation. They feel as if they have been catapulted into some kind of dreamscape. It is so atypical of the narcissist to display emotions that any, any ostentatious behavior usually associated with emotions is very, very disorienting, very confusing. And it is this confusion that the narcissist leverages. It is this disorientation that the narcissist wishes to induce because then people's defenses are down their vulnerabilities are exposed, and this allows the narcissist to obtain his goals, usually some form of narcissistic supply, or if the narcissist is malignant and psychopathic, to obtain other goals, such as sex, or services, or supply, which is sadistic, or anything else, access, power, you name it. In the face of tears, people become defenseless. They, even, they either become very sad, they empathize, or they exalt, they're happy. And in both situations, it's easy to make them do what you want them to do. They're vulnerable. The narcissist's choice to cry is rare. Narcissists very rarely cry. But when they do, it has to do with rage. The narcissist's tears do not reflect an underlying depressive position. They're not associated with sadness. Sadness, hopelessness, helplessness, like in normal healthy people. On the very contrary, the narcissist cries because he is furious. And he is furious because he experiences self-pity. The narcissist, it's as if the narcissist is telling himself, I'm being victimized here. I should pity myself. But pitying myself is shameful because it means I'm not godlike. 
I'm not omnipotent. So I'm experiencing shame. This shame is life-threatening. Now, who made me cry? My wife made me cry. My girlfriend made me cry. My boyfriend made me cry. My coworker made me cry. My boss made me cry. The government made me cry. Someone made me cry. And this agent, this entity who made me or which made me cry, they are all bad. They are evil. Narcissists, you remember, are children. The mental and psychological age of a typical narcissist is around two years old. When the narcissist comes across a situation where he feels frustrated, denied, abandoned, ignored, rejected, humiliated, or shamed, when he comes across a situation like this, or even when he anticipates such outcomes, he immediately regresses, he infantilizes, he becomes a baby or a toddler, an infant in any case. And then at that point, he feels helplessness, self-pity, impotent rage, and this triggers splitting. I'm all good, says the narcissist. I'm all good. And the people who made me cry, the institutions who made me cry, the circumstances which made me cry, they are all bad. This is called dichotomous thinking. It's a division of the world into all bad and all good, with the narcissist as the archangel or the godlike figure, which by definition, definition is all good. The minute the narcissist splits, you made the narcissist cry because you resisted him, you objected to something, you disagreed with him, you humiliated him. Whatever the reason may be, at that point the narcissist splits. He becomes all good and you become all bad. There's self-pity and there's a sense of threat. Because there's a sense of threat, a psychopathic protector self-state emerges, which is a fancy way of saying that the narcissist becomes highly psychopathic, highly antisocial. This is very reminiscent of this, the mechanism in borderline personality disorder. When the, when the borderline anticipates or experiences rejection, abandonment, separation and humiliation, she becomes a secondary psychopath. When the narcissist experiences the same, when he's frustrated, when he's impotently enraged, when he is self-pitying, when he experiences shame and mortification, at that point, he becomes a primary psychopath. It's a temporary stage known as the protector self-state. But still, he becomes utterly psychopathic. Dangerous, aggressive, sometimes violent, defiant, contumacious, hateful of authority, and reckless. You are faced with a psychopath, not with a narcissist. Think of it as multiple personality disorder. When you trigger the narcissist, when you confront the narcissist, when you object to something, when you resist, when you disagree, when you shame the narcissist somehow, when you expose him, when you degrade him and reduce him and criticize him and insult him, when any of this happens, it's multiple personality, the narcissist personality or the narcissistic self-state vanishes and the psychopathic self-state, which is protective, takes over. And the psychopathic self-state has only one goal, only one goal, to eliminate you, to destroy you, to remove you from the scene, because you are a constant source of dissonance, constant source of discomfort, displeasure, shame, harrowing shame, utterly consuming shame. And and the psychopathic protector self-state has to remove you 
mentally, psychologically, and if all else fails, physically. When we, when we witness situations like uh, the Watts family, and where the narcissist murdered his wife and his, his own children, it's because the process that I'm describing has happened. As a psychopath took over, the narcissist became a full-fledged psychopath. And then the only thing this psychopath could focus on, the only goal, it's a tunnel vision. He, this psychopathic protector self state is a one-track minded robotic monstrosity and needs to get rid of you in whatever way, whatever it takes, is going to do it. Remember that the narcissist is a very powerful adult, but with the mindset of a child. Frustration, according to Dallard in 1939, frustration leads to aggression. And this is true for adults as well, but because the narcissist is a child, mentally speaking, psychologically speaking, he's an infant. The frustration and the aggression are associated with magical thinking, with temper tantrums, with inability to control impulses, impulsivity, with rage that is all, all subsuming, um, and with the splitting of a maternal figure. You're the narcissist's mother, and you have let the narcissist down. You've disappointed the narcissist. You have proven to the narcissist that you're a bad mother. And so as a bad mother, you deserve to die, sometimes literally, but definitely figuratively. The magical thinking allows the narcissist to construct implausible, impossible, science fiction kind narratives. The narcissist transitions into a psychopathic self-state. The psychopathic self-state protects the narcissist from the shame that is self-destructive and life-threatening. And the psychopathic self-state seeks to destroy you because you are the one who provoked this shame. You are the one who made the narcissist cry. So you see, the psychopath, the newly emergent psychopathic self-state, seeks to destroy you. You're the cause of this frustration. But because the narcissist is a child and because he has magical thinking in his mind, all this is temporary. In other words, even if the narcissist were to kill you physically, in his mind as a child, a two-year-old child, the, your death is a temporary condition, a transient condition. You're going to revive. You're going to resurrect. You're going to come alive again. It's as crazy as this. The narcissist's magical thinking is exceedingly infantile. It's very rudimentary. And so the narcissist believes that his wishes always come true. Now he wishes you dead. Two hours from now, he wishes you alive. And he sees no contradiction between these two wishes. He is all-powerful. He is godlike. Now imagine a two-year-old psychopath equipped with the body of an adult, the instruments of an adult, and the, the weapons of an adult. It's a major risk. Major risk. And you should take this very seriously. When the narcissist starts to cry, pack your things and go away. Go away for a few hours, go away for a few days, Make sure that he calmed down. Make sure that he has regained his equilibrium and his homeostasis. And make sure that he has reverted from a psychopathic protector self-state to a narcissistic self-state. Make sure that he no longer perceives you as a threat. He no longer regards you as a slayer. He no, no longer considers you as his the agent of his, of his death and dissolution and destruction. In other words, you're no longer the enemy. You're no longer the persecutory object. As long as a narcissist expresses 
anger with you, frustration, and so on, stay away. Initial communication with the narcissist should be remotely, via the internet, via phone, Skype, I don't know. Do not be in the physical presence of the narcissist, especially when he cries. Remember, healthy, normal people misinterpret behaviors and traits of narcissists because the narcissist is a mirror image of a healthy person. It's a topsy-turvy human being or wannabe human being. <laughs> so, whereas when people cry, they're less dangerous. When the narcissist cries, he is way more dangerous. I want to talk a bit about frustration and what we know about frustration and so on and so forth. Frustration is when we have an impulse and we, can, we cannot act on it. Now, this is a very primordial, this is a very atavistic and basic way of looking at the human psyche, at, the human, at human psychology. We all have impulses, but in due time, we learn how to constrain them, how to control them, and how to sublimate them, how to convert the energy of the impulse into a socially acceptable activity. And yet, it creates frustration. Whenever we want something very badly, and there's no way we can get it, we become frustrated. Whenever we feel the need to act, whenever we actually act, and the outcomes do not correspond to our expectations, to our imagined outcomes, we become frustrated. Whenever you're prevented from obtaining something you've been led to expect, based on past experience, for example, based on social norms, then you become angry and then you become aggressive. Frustration translates into anger or rage in the case of the narcissist, and this leads to aggression or violence in the case of the psychopath. It's valid. This, this paradigm of frustration, aggression is valid in all the animal kingdom, not only among human animals. Non-human animals react with visible frustration. For example, when they're hungry. If you prevent a hungry animal from obtaining food that it can see, food that it can smell, it, the animal reacts with frustration and immediately with aggression. When a child is not allowed to play with a visible toy or with a peer, the child becomes aggressive and very often violent. Internal forces can include motivational conflicts and inhibitions. External forces can include the actions of other individuals, admonitions of parents or others, and the rules of society, injunctions both societal and parental. All these lead to the restraining and constricting of impulses, to the moderation and tempering of expectations, all these are accompanied with a modicum, some level of frustration, and frustration therefore is an emotional state. There are good arguments to suggest that frustration is an emotion and therefore is subjected to, subject to emotional dysregulation. We can be overwhelmed, overcome by hate, by fear, by love, we can be overwhelmed, overcome by frustration. Indeed, in classical psychoanalytic theory, uh, frustration is perceived as some kind of psychic energy that is dammed up, that is, uh, uh, that is accumulated, and then seeks an outlet in wish-fulfilling fantasies and dreams or in various neurotic symptoms. Frustration is a huge power and it can wear many guises and disguises, camouflages itself. In the case of the narcissist, frustration is intolerable. We say that narcissists have a low threshold of frustration. This threshold is even lower when it comes to psychopaths. So when the narcissist transitions from a narcissistic self-state to a psychopathic self-state, the, the tolerance of frustration goes even further down and the potential for aggression in violence is much enhanced. I keep mentioning the frustration-aggression hypothesis 
first proposed in 1939 by John Dollard and his colleagues. Dollard said that frustration always produces an aggressive urge and that aggression is always a result of prior frustrations. Neil Miller, one of the proponents of this theory, later noted that frustration can lead to several kinds of actions, but he maintained that the urge to aggression will become more dominant the longer the frustration lasts. In 1989, a US psychologist by the name of Leonard Berkowitz, no, not the son of Sam, <laughs> someone else, Leonard Berkowitz, he proposed that frustration must be decidedly unpleasant in order to evoke an aggressive urge. So, as you see, there are debates about nuances, but there is no psychologist alive or dead who would dispute the in ineluctable and direct connection between frustration and aggression. So when you say the narcissist is crying, he's frustrated. You know the next stage is going to be aggression. It could be overt aggression. It could be passive aggression. It could be sabotage or undermining. It could be something bad, but something bad is going to happen. Why stay? Why take the chance? Why continue to interrupt? Walk away. We have something called, in psychology, something called frustrative non-reward hypothesis. It's a proposition that when you withhold previously given reinforcement of responses, this creates frustration, which leads to aggression. In operant or instrumental conditioning, we reinforce behaviors. If you behave well, you get a positive reinforcement. For example, you're allowed to watch a Sam Vaknin video. When you behave badly, then you get a negative reinforcement. Actually, you don't get a negative reinforcement, but the positive reinforcement is withheld. In other words, you're not allowed to watch a Sam Vaknin video, which is the end of the world. So this is known as operant or instrumental conditioning. Now imagine that you developed an expectation that whenever you behave well, you're going to hear my voice and going to see my face and you're going to live the rest of your life in bliss. And then suddenly you behave well and someone prevents you, doesn't give you, doesn't allow you to access YouTube. This would create frustration and the frustration would lead to aggression. The internal state of frustration motivates the subject. This is known as the frustration effect. Frustration creates motivation, but the motivation is negative. Frustration, the motivation generated or engendered by frustration is a motivation to remove the reason for the frustration, the cause of the frustration. So it's a destructive motivation. You wish to destroy the entity, the situation, the institution, that frustrated you. This was first described by Abraham Emsel, who was a US behavioral psychologist. I mentioned frustration tolerance. It's the ability of an individual to delay gratification or to preserve relative equanimity when encountering obstacles. So many people have a high frustration tolerance. They try to do something, it's not working well, they come across many obstacles and hindrances and impediments, and they persevere. They still go on. Or they expect something good to happen, it doesn't happen. Or they expect some reward, and they don't get it. Or they have an impulse, they want something, and they can't obtain it, so they have to delay gratification. These people are mature. They're adults. They know how to control the frustration, sometimes even how to channel the frustration to convert it into positive motivation. Narcissists can do, cannot do any of these things. Narcissists are children. They cannot delay gratification. They act on their impulses. They are furious when they are denied some benefit or reward. When they encounter an obstacle, they regress, they go back, they don't go forward. They are very, in effect, helpless. There's a, narcissism is a form of learned helplessness. It's as if the narcissist says, reality is too much for me. 
I'm unable to cope with reality. I don't have the skills. I'm inadequate. This, this is known as the internalized bad object. So I'm going to give up on reality. I'm going to live in fantasy. But then the narcissist expects you to participate in the fantasy, to support the fantasy, to affirm the fantasy, to confirm the fantasy, and to become a, a figment of the fantasy. And if you don't, you're an enemy. You're a bad mother. And you really, really, really need to be punished. And the fury is so enormous that the narcissist starts to cry. He's so frustrated. Reminds you of something? Yes, the terrible twos. Two-year-old babies, two-year-old infants. That's a narcissist. The growth of adequate frustration tolerance occurs as a part of the child's cognitive and affective development. If the child's development is disrupted or arrested by abuse and trauma, by being instrumentalized or parentified, then the child does not develop the necessary cognitive and affective tools to cope with frustration. There is no strengthening of the adaptive levels which allow a mature adult individual to cope with frustration. Only therapeutic intervention could help, but narcissists are not amenable to therapy, of course, because they compete with the therapist. <laughs> they are more knowledgeable than the therapist. They are more intelligent than the therapist. They are also more handsome than the therapist, and they are definitely younger than the therapist. So, therapy is no good. Without therapy and without the necessary adult mature tools of coping with frustration, the narcissist is exposed to constant cycles of frustration, aggression, frustration, aggression, frustration, aggression. Gradually, aggression becomes a second habit. The narcissist becomes more verbally abusive, not less. More prone to violence, not less. More externalized aggression, not less. More destructive to himself and to others, not less. Narcissism is a condition that is exacerbated by habituation. The narcissist gets used to aggression as a solution to frustration. And so it becomes a habit. That is why it's very dangerous to witness the narcissist's frustration and to try to intervene in any way, negatively or positively. Because you will bring on your head the wrath of the narcissist and his wish to get rid of you in any way. At that moment, the narcissist is clinically insane, utterly psychotic, insane, and doesn't know what he's doing and definitely cannot control. There's no decision making. There's no process of rational choice. There's just primitive, primordial urges that take over the narcissist. He becomes an automaton, a robot with the wrong programming, with glitchy programming. You'd better stay away. So when the narcissist cries, don't cry with don't cry with him. When the narcissist cry, don't try to hug him or embrace him. That will you that is humiliating and shameful. When the narcissist cries, don't offer advice or succor or help, because this means the narcissist is less than godlike. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful, not all-knowing. You're humiliating the narcissist. When the narcissist cries, don't empathize with him. Don't cry too. Don't. When the narcissist cries, definitely don't gloat. Don't be. Don't. Don't be happy. Don't smile. Don't laugh. When the narcissist cries, there's only one thing to do: pick up your purse, a few changes of clothes, your car keys. Slam the door behind you and do not come back at all, or at least don't come back until you've made sure that the narcissist psychopath, an inner psychopath, the psychopath that has taken over when you have frustrated the narcissist and denied him, that psychopath is gone. Because this psychopath wants you dead, at least metaphorically, but unfortunately on some occasions, physically.